Throughout the Galactic Civil War, the Imperial Navy never seemed to figure out just how to grapple with the Rebel Alliance. Its fleets were still organized as if they were fighting the Clone Wars, with many of its most senior commanders dogmatically refusing to accept that when pitched against the Rebel Alliance, they were now fighting a very different kind of war. So in this, the pilot episode of Building Your Battle Group, the Templin Institute will attempt to solve this problem. We'll analyze the assets available to the Imperial Navy and try to construct a new fleet designed to fight and win the war the Empire was actually fighting and not the one they thought they were. In doing so, we'll eschew traditional Imperial doctrine, modify a few designs, and switch up some Starfighter complements so they make more sense. But before we begin this intellectual exercise of ours, we need to define the parameters and limitations this fleet will be operating under. First, we'll say that it was initially deployed right about midway through the Galactic Civil War, right around the time of the Battle of Hoth. Most of the Clone Wars era equipment has been phased out by this point, and we're right at the peak of the Imperial Military Industrial Complex. Secondly, this is what the Empire would consider a high readiness force. Many militaries use something called a Force Generation Model, or FGM, to categorize its units into different levels of readiness so they can prioritize resources accordingly. The exact terminology and structure changes between navies and who knows what the Empire calls it, but for our purposes, we'll imagine that a Tier 4 unit is still in training or otherwise unavailable for deployment, whereas a Tier 1 unit is ready to roll and given priority for new equipment and reinforcements. And while this fleet we're making isn't going to be the most important formation in the galaxy, it is one that the Empire wants to keep supplied and combat ready, so we'll put it in the highest tier, Tier 1. And lastly, and most importantly, we need to consider the role of this formation. Now, the Imperial Navy operates several numbered fleets, the most famous being Thrawn's 7th Fleet. These are permanent formations with upwards of several thousand warships, dedicated naval bases, support facilities, and everything else. But the thing is, these huge numbered fleets are responsible for enormous sections of the galaxy, and as a result are essentially never deployed en masse. Rather, they're divided into many different task forces or other smaller formations that can then be specialized towards specific duties. So in our case, we'll imagine that Thrawn, Piet, Mahdi, Sloan, or somebody else has put the Templin Institute in charge of one of these smaller task forces. Our mission is to locate and destroy the Rebel Alliance's interstellar assets, its cruisers, starfighters, and whatever else we might find flying the Red Starbird. We're not looking to hunt down Rebel bases or root out sympathizers. Our primary concern is crippling the Rebellion's ability to conduct interstellar war. Faced with this objective, there are three main things our fleet will need to be able to do. Locate enemy interstellar assets, create the conditions for a decisive battle, and prevent the enemy's withdrawal. The Imperial Navy is famously pretty poor at at least a couple of these, so we'll need to rely on a few tricks. And the first one is that we're throwing away most Imperial Navy doctrines. Overwhelming displays of military force have their place, but if this battle group is going to be chasing rebels across the galaxy, it needs to be powerful, but also nimble. We need to constantly be at the highest state of readiness, so things like resupply, logistics, and administration should be as straightforward as possible. Oh, and it also needs a name. Now realistically, it wouldn't make sense to give a temporary task force like this its own unit insignia or unique name. It would probably be called something boring like Task Force 89. And you know what, I'm fine with that, but at least let's give it a cool nickname. How about we just steal one from 1967 and call Task Force 89 the Outer Rim Yacht Club? We'll let every other Imperial formation try way too hard to sound badass. I want my crews to be diligent, but also possess an esprit de corps based on humor, camaraderie, unity, and creativity. Everyone in this fleet should be concentrating on their jobs, not worried if their commander is going to use space magic to asphyxiate them when they make a mistake. And when my yacht club wipes the floor with the executioners of death or whatever other formations call themselves during Imperial Navy exercises, it will be all the sweeter. So let's start with our main battle line. This is the component of our fleet that once rebel starships have been brought to battle can destroy them. Its responsibilities are nice and straightforward. For this, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. My first selection is going to be three Imperial II class Star Destroyers. Why three? Well, I think that's about the minimum number you'd need to destroy pretty much 90% of the formations the rebels are using. It's easy to forget that the enormous engagements that occurred over Endor and Jakku were pretty rare up until the end of the war. At the time our battle group is being used, the rebels still favor dividing their forces and avoiding pitched confrontations. 
Now, the reputation of the Imperial class seems to have taken a bit of a hit in recent years. Footage of them crashing all over the galaxy probably didn't help, but I think this points to failures in how these ships are being used, rather than deficiencies with the class itself. So the standing order I'll be giving to each of the captains assigned to these ships is going to be, take a lesson from Vader. I don't want to see these ships keeping their distance. I don't want to see them trying to cut off avenues of escape. This is not a Venator, this is an Imperial II. All I want to see these things doing is closing the distance as fast as they possibly can and beating the absolute shit out of anything that gets in their way. I want this part of my fleet to become infamous within the Rebel Alliance and known as Murderer's Row. But if the Imperial II does have a slight deficiency, it's not so much with the ship itself, but rather the starfighters assigned to it. And as we'll bring up a few times over the course of building this battle group, Imperial admirals and commanders do seem to have quite a bit of influence when it comes to the equipment they're assigned. Director Krennic basically forced Sinar fleet systems to produce a special shuttle for him, and Admiral Thrawn had the TIE Defender project, not to mention all the things Tarkin was involved in. What I'm trying to say is, it doesn't seem completely out of the question for the commander of an elite unit like mine within the Imperial Navy to make a few changes. We can't get greedy, but we can pull a few strings. So I'm going to start from scratch on the Imperial II Starfighter complement. It can hold roughly six squadrons plus a few auxiliary units, so we're looking at around 96 craft. For my first three squadrons, I want TIE Interceptors. We're going to load them up with as many concussion missiles as we can manage. I've never understood why Imperial Starfighter Doctrine favors these close dogfights when missiles are available. But assuming they're not extraordinarily expensive, I'd want them as standard issue on all my fighters. TIE Interceptors constitute the bulk of these forces, but they'll mainly be used defensively. It's right there in the name. I want these sticking pretty close to the fleet, intercepting anything posing a danger. Instead, the offensive component of our Starfighter complement will be TIE Defenders. So much of Rebel firepower is concentrated on their Starfighters that having a solid counter is an absolute necessity, and the Defender is the only ship that can reliably perform better than T-65 X-Wings. Getting my hands on these might be tricky. Supposedly, the program was cancelled with funding diverted to the Death Star, but there's evidence that at least a few were active across the Galactic Civil War, so I'm confident I could get my hands on at least one squadron for each of my Star Destroyers, especially in a post-Yavin environment. Next up, I'd have a squadron of TIE Bombers on two of my destroyers. In most cases, I'd expect these to be outfitted with anti-ship missiles, but the capacity to drop some heavier ordnance onto space stations or planetary bodies is something I'd like to maintain in this fleet. It would likely come up only rarely, but it's one of those things where you'd hate to need it and not have it. The remaining destroyer will be given TIE Punishers. Same role, just with greater firepower. We'd probably only break these out when going up against something with very heavy shields. Now with our last two squadrons, I'm going to be spending a bit more influence within the Imperial Military Industrial Complex because we need some craft that might not exist. This entire fleet will essentially be useless if it can't locate the enemy, and given the Imperial Navy's success in this so far, we need to find some new solutions. And for me, the Lambda Shuttle is looking pretty interesting. Though mainly used as a simple transport, I see a platform with a lot of empty room for reconnaissance equipment. I want to get the best sensor suite available to the Imperial Navy and duct tape it to these things if that's what it takes. These squadrons will be the eyes and ears of the fleet. Most of the time, they'll be operating independently, tracking rebel movements and relaying their disposition back to the main force. We mentioned at the top that one of the main objectives of this fleet will be to create the conditions for a decisive battle, and these are the tools you need to do it. If this squadron does its job, we'll have already won every engagement before the first shots are even fired because we'll know the strength of the enemy, their heading, and any potential avenues of escape. The final squadron aboard our Star Destroyers I'd like to be dedicated to electronic warfare. This is something the Empire only seems marginally interested in, so it's hard to get a grasp of their capabilities. But essentially, what I want this squadron to do is reduce the effectiveness of enemy munitions, ion torpedoes especially, jam communications, and to whatever extent possible, keep the enemy confused and misdirected. While not specifically designed to fulfill this role, I think the TIE Command Shuttle could be pretty easily modified to be some kind of electronic warfare craft, so we'll keep a squadron of those aboard each destroyer. That, to me, seems like a pretty solid battle line, but we'll add just one more capital ship whose role will be obvious, an Interdictor Class Star Destroyer. One of the stated aims of this task force is to prevent the escape of the enemy, and this is how you do it. Interdictors are definitely rare, but I don't think it would be an insurmountable challenge to have one assigned to this fleet, given it's pretty much a necessity for the formation to do its job. 
Now we move on to our escorts, which in most Imperial fleets that even bother to include them seem rather aimless. I think we can give them a bit more structure, and we'll do this by bringing to the Imperial Navy the concept of the escort squadron. I'm kinda making up my own doctrine on the fly here, but the idea is a formation designed to work in tandem with the larger ships of the battle group, but that also has the capability to function as an independent flotilla as circumstances dictate. Our main battle line is going to be escorted by two such squadrons of identical composition. For this, I like the Arquitans class light cruiser. It's a proven ship dating back to the Clone Wars, they're available in large numbers, and having been built by Kuat, likely share a lot of the same technology, spare parts, and ammunition as our larger Star Destroyers. All very handy when you're trying to keep a large fleet like this nimble. But the biggest advantage of this class is that a command variant exists. Presumably, it includes additional flag and command and control facilities. This makes it a perfect leader for our escort squadron. So we'll include a single command variant and then three of the standard Arquitans class. And because I think I've used up almost all the clout I have with my superiors, I won't try and fill these ships with TIE Defenders. Instead, we'll stick to the standard squadron layout on two of the standard variants with an interceptor squadron on the remainder. I still have a few things on my shopping list that might be hard to get, so I don't want to get too greedy here. I do want to add a few other ships to these escort squadrons, though. Something that can provide for them the same general set of capabilities that our starfighter squadrons did to our destroyers, specifically reconnaissance and electronic warfare. Essentially, the intent here is that if one or both of these squadrons is acting independently from the main battle line, it can maintain its eyes and ears, and when these squadrons and the battle line are deployed together, there is a kind of interlocking redundancy. The loss of a single element will never cripple the entire fleet. So for reconnaissance purposes, I want each escort squadron to include a single Raider-class corvette. As with our Lambda shuttles, we'll be retrofitting these with the best sensor suites we can get. I'd even be tempted to strip out most of their weapons, just to make it absolutely clear to whoever's captaining these ships that I don't want them anywhere near the fighting. The role of these ships will be to sit on the periphery of the engagement, providing targeting information and whatever else to the rest of the squadron or the larger battle fleet. That might come as a surprise to some of you, as the Raider has a pretty good reputation as an anti-fighter platform, so why isn't it being used that way? Well, my thinking on the matter is that corvettes just don't really belong in the kinds of naval actions this fleet will be pursuing. They're intended mainly as patrol vessels and orbital support, not something that should be heading out into open water, so to speak. During a large-scale fleet engagement in which potentially dozens of enemy squadrons might be operating, I just don't think the corvettes provide enough bang for your buck. To be effective, you might need dozens of them, and their small size means they would need to be constantly resupplied. Far more economical, I think, to rely on the Arquitans and TIE Defenders. In the reconnaissance role, though, I think two is a good number as that way both can be quickly docked to one of our Star Destroyers whenever the inevitable need for resupply occurs. The last element I'll be including in this escort squadron is a single IGV-55 listening ship. This is, to my knowledge, one of the few Imperial starships dedicated towards electronic warfare, so it's an easy pick. Like our modified TIE command shuttles, I want these craft to be jamming munitions and causing confusion amongst the enemy. These vessels are also capable of reconnaissance, so these IGV-55s might be able to replace the aforementioned raiders, but I want to keep my reconnaissance and electronic warfare elements separate, and an additional layer of redundancy never hurts. We'll assign two of these escort squadrons to the fleet, and with that, I think the task force is really starting to come together. The last step will be looking at any potential gaps in our capabilities and working to solve them. And right away, there's a bit of an issue. If our battle line is supposed to be charging towards the enemy, and the escort squadrons are supporting them, the Interdictor Star Destroyer is starting to look very exposed. I think it's going to need a dedicated escort, and I got my eye on the Victory 2 class Star Destroyer. That's a pretty big ship to dedicate purely to escorting another, but I think because Interdiction is the one element we can't really create additional layers of redundancy for, it's going to be worth it. And I like the Victory 2 specifically, because of the configuration it's sometimes outfitted with that includes a very large number of concussion missile launchers. This ship is pretty much always going to be near the rear of the formation, so having some longer range weapons is a nice way of making sure it's still able to engage enemy targets. I'm also going to make sure that whoever is in command of this vessel is someone I trust. I need a professional in this position, not someone who's going to abandon the formation at the first shot of personal glory. Now the final ship I want to include in this battle group is a Cantwell-class Arrestor Cruiser. While not a true replacement for the Interdictor, it does have limited but similar capabilities, and anything that can prevent the Rebels from retreating is a worthwhile investment. 
Unfortunately, it does need to be near the front of the formation to operate effectively, and there is a chance that in a major fleet action, this thing would be a suiting Porg. But on the off chance a rebel commander tries to ram one of my ships, we'll get some fun footage for the Imperial Navy holiday blooper reel. But I want to push my luck a bit further and ask for one more favor from the Imperial High Command. Or maybe I introduced Grand Admiral Thrawn to Art Deco and now he owes me a big favor. However I managed it, I would love to include a TIE Phantom. This is the Imperial Navy's only and perhaps the very first true stealth starfighter. These are exceedingly rare and according to common military knowledge impossible, and possessing capabilities that your enemy isn't aware exist is a huge advantage in itself. Of course, its cloaking device means it's much too valuable to engage the enemy directly in a dogfight, so I'd only use it as another layer of reconnaissance, something that can slip in undetected close to the rebel fleet and keep tabs on its movements. And with that, finally, our task force is completed. What we have here is hopefully a formation sophisticated enough to detect rebel movements, nimble enough to keep pace with them, and yet formidable enough to overpower them. Imperial admirals tend to be rather unimaginative in their maneuvers, usually relying on nothing more than the time-tested front towards enemy, but this fleet, I think, opens up a large number of interesting possibilities. Ideally, this formation would seed an area known for its rebel activity with reconnaissance platforms, identify rebel fleets, and intercept them. But there's also the potential for its escort squadrons to lure enemy forces into a trap or dozens more creative tactics. But before we end things, I'll do my best to get ahead of my critics. I'm sure some of you are wondering why we didn't include the venerable Venator, or even try to use my influence to create some kind of Venator too. The reason is, its role as more of a dedicated carrier just really isn't needed. Between our Star Destroyers alone, I think we have a significant fighter wing, and because we're relying on defenders and interceptors, overwhelming numbers just aren't as important to me. The same applies to the larger Secutor class fleet carrier and the smaller Quasar escort carrier. Escort carriers are pretty big losers in my eye, but we'll touch on that in a future video. The point is, I want quality, not quantity. This isn't the Clone Wars, the Rebels rarely operate any more than just a few squadrons, and in my fleet at least, pilots are not expendable. And while it was also very tempting to include a larger command ship, maybe something like an Asserter Star Dreadnought, it would be hard to justify it. Our fleet is too small to really require a command ship of that size, and it would just slow down what is supposed to be a faster formation. I want to keep logistically nimble, or at least nimble enough. Between our Star Destroyers alone, we already have 90,000 personnel. It's going to be a big enough challenge already to keep this fleet in a state of constant readiness. So this to me is a pretty solid formation, but that of course is just my opinion. And even though Task Force 89 has already achieved a string of impressive victories across the Outer Rim, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you see any glaring weaknesses in this formation? How would you command it? And what would your ideal Imperial fleet look like in this role? Let me know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been Incoming. What you just watched is the pilot episode for a new series we're calling Building Your Battle Group, where the Templin Institute constructs fleets, armies, and other formations from across alternate worlds. This is one of four new shows we're releasing this week, and on Friday, our patrons will have the chance to vote on which ones will become a regular addition to Incoming. If you'd like to take part, a pledge of just $2 on our Patreon will get you a vote. 